All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming today and, and welcome to the, uh, the first of our uh, Inside Edge live industry panels. Today, we're going to focus on, on the construction space. And, you know, as we thought about these panels, normally this time of year, you know, we've been in Orlando, we're in Orlando for, for that big week, which is usually the highlight of, of the RV year. We're getting together with everybody, we're meeting. But, you know, this year we couldn't do that, right? And we all know the circumstances that are going on, you know, these days, it's just, it's, it's difficult, right? It's been, a, it's been a crazy 12 months. You know, if you, if you look back to where we were probably a year ago when all this started and everything that's gone on, you know, since then, right? From, from stimulus to election, to you know, travel. I mean, I'm, I myself, I'm you know, it looks dark. That's because I'm in Europe, uh, and I've got to like alter my plans to get home because I can't actually get from the country of Sweden to the country of Denmark, right? As a U.S. citizen, we've had an election, you know, and, and we've kind of rolled into this year, and it's been actually just one, you know, really, you know, I don't think we've ever seen a year like this, and and so, but man, it, but we've worked through it. One of the interesting things is that in our space we've been working through it right building is going on harvesting is going on delivering is going on essentially you know we have been an, an essential business and you know just thank you to you know all the folks out there you know on the front line who are out there doing the work that needs to be done to get us through all this but we've kept going and at the same time, we've actually been buying and selling equipment. And, and today with you know the start of the new year and things really picking up, we thought we'd get some folks together, some industry experts, and let's talk about you know, essentially what we're seeing in the equipment market when it comes to the prices for, for this equipment. So we've got a great panel of experts today. Uh, you know, I, wanna, I wanna take some time and introduce them. Uh, let's start. Doug Olive, why don't you uh, why don't you kick us off? Then we'll go to Doug Rush, and then Kevin Kobus, and then Michael's going to join us in a little bit. So, Doug Olive, why don't you kick us off? Give us a little intro. Thank you, Matt, and good morning or good afternoon if you're dialing in. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Doug Olive here. Um, I'm fortunate enough. I've been with Ritchie Brothers uh, for just my 25th year right now. Uh, I re originally prior to that, I came from a retail construction environment. And I've been fortunate enough to work alongside the sales group for the first part of my career in the organization. And then the past 10 or 11 years, I've been our senior vice president for pricing and valuations within the organization. So supporting uh, on a global uh, basis our, our entire sales team uh, on pricing and valuation. So we're in a, in a fun market right now, and uh, it's been a great ride. Recently, we had a nice, obviously, you saw our Q4 results and pricing's been good and it's been exciting times up there. So, Matt, thank you for that. Yep. Hey, D today we have a special guest as well. We have uh, Doug Rush from, from, from Rouse Services who's joining us today to give us a, a little bit of a different uh, perspective on what's going on outside the auction space. So, Doug, why don't you tell us a little bit about Rouse and a little bit about your history there? Yeah, happy to do that. Uh, thanks, Matt, and good morning or get good afternoon to the folks on the call. Nice to be with you today. My name is Doug Rush. Uh, I am a managing director at Rouse Services. And for those of you that don't know, uh, Rouse joined the Ritchie family in the fourth quarter of last year. And just a quick primer on the Rouse business, because it may not be familiar to everybody on the call, we are really an information services company and have been for the better part of the last 20 years. We are laser focused on the construction sector. So practically what that means is that we work with fleet owners, whether they be rental companies, OEM dealers, large contractors, and we're in the business of delivering data, benchmarks, uh, really market insights back to our customers in an effort to help them uh, run their businesses more effectively as the various used equipment markets are moving all around us. So on a nightly basis, uh, we are tracking some $65 billion of equipment that's out there in the equipment universe. We are uh, analyzing close to $20 billion of private retail transactional data. 
We can supplement that, of course, with all the auction data that comes from the Ritchie Brothers Iron Planet and some of the other auctioneers that operate here in North America. And just really excited to be with the group this morning to bring a little bit more of a broad view, let's say, when we talk about trends on really what's happening in the various used equipment channels that you as a seller or perhaps as a buyer have an opportunity to participate in. Right. Th thanks, Doug. Now, let's hear from uh, Kevin. You're, you're a man that's uh, pretty much probably seen it all this year. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about, uh, give us a little bit of, you know, a bit on your background and what you've been doing. Thanks, Matt. And uh, good day, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today. Uh, Kevin Kobus, I'm a VP of operations for the United States and Mexico. Um, and in my role, um, I oversee everything from the large Orlando auction, uh, just recently acquired the responsibility for the Iron Planet weekly featured auction as well. Uh, so my teams handle um, everything from welcoming people to our sites uh, to welcoming people to online auctions uh, every week. Um, and as to Matt alluded there, we've uh, we quickly pivoted last March from um, uh, live in-person bidding at, at auction sites uh, to just allowing the public to come in and inspect equipment prior to uh, purchasing and then pivoting to an online model uh, where you would do all your bidding from from our online resources. Um, so yeah, it's been quite a year as Matt says and uh, you know our our main goal was to keep our customers and our employees safe. And, um, you know, it's it's one of our uh, proudest things to report that uh, to date we have not had any uh, employee to employee transmission of the COVID uh, virus. And uh, so what we're doing has been been working very well for us uh, this past year. No, that it, and it has been. It's been it, it's been one major transition for us as a company. And just a little bit about myself. My name is Matt Ackley. Uh, I'm Chief Marketing Officer of Ritchie Brothers. I'll be moderating the discussion today. Uh, the way it's going to work is, you know, we we've got you know a bunch of questions that that we get all the time, right? And we're gonna we're gonna have these guys walk through and and kind of create some discussion here. And then, you know, at the end, we've got it open for you. Just enter your questions via chat uh, and they'll be relayed to us as, as we go on. So first, you know, Doug O, right? If you wanna, we got two Dougs on the panel, by the way. So Doug O, uh, be Doug Olive. So Doug, why don't you talk to us a little bit about, you know, what were the, you know, what were kind of the, the, big, the big movers between 2019 and 2020? Sure, Matt, thank you. Yeah, as, as, as you've read or as you see on the screen here last year, um, the, for sure there was a, an uptick of some of the assets we sold and there was a, a big uptick of whether it's boom lifts, telescoping forklifts, multi-terrain loaders, forklifts and scissors. Many reasons for that and um, that we saw in the market, but what we did see for sure is very, very solid demand throughout the year for all those assets. And as, as some of the rental companies were able to turn some of their uh, their older assets we saw some of that for sure last year and the demand was right behind them for sure and uh, we saw great pricing throughout the year when we pivoted uh, in in mid-march literally from from um, both online and live to 100 percent online uh, it literally there was a lot more drive to the to the website traffic for sure whether it was site visits um, priority bidding, registrations, everything we saw uh, to, to, to push the, the demand and the strength for these assets. So it was very good overall. <laughs> We've got, uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to, we're kind of trying to connect Michael here. So as soon as we can, uh, we'll bring him in. Just, uh, just another great example of, of, uh, of COVID driving things. Anyway, so you know that that's a great synopsis of you know of of the auction market. You know we see kind of that ebbs and ebb and flow when supply comes in. You know it, it you know it was really a shift for us on the demand side as well. You know driving people to online bidding only, and we'll talk a, a little bit about that. Uh, you know later in the in the podcast, but you know Doug R, you kind of seeing the same thing on the uh, on your side of the house outside of the auction space. Yeah, yeah, absolutely we are, Matt. I think Doug Olive, um, 
the, the trends that he highlighted are, are actually quite similar to the trends that we see in the private retail space as well. And just to remind everybody on the group or everybody on the call here, uh, Rouse is tracking private transactional sales from more than 200 fleet owners across North America. Again, that's that 20 uh, billion dollars of private transactional data I mentioned earlier. So out of that data set, really from a seller's perspective, from these large fleet owners, we're really able to dial in a good understanding of what's moving through some of those private channels. And you can see the categories on the page and how much overlap there is in the retail space and the auction space. I think, you know, as, as you think about the different groupings here, a couple of trends that I would highlight. One, you see a lot of aerial equipment, lifting equipment. Well, that's th those products have really become rental first products in the marketplace by and large. And so the dynamic that you're picking up on is that some of those rental companies are, are, are cycling over their fleet, right? A lot of those fleets started to grow substantially in the late 2010s, and that equipment is now reaching the age of sale where it's time to start cycling new equipment. And so I think that's driving a lot of the aerial equipment and the telehandlers. The second area where we saw a lot of growth is on the compact earth moving side of the house. These are um, compact track loaders, skid steer loaders, right? That really coincides with the kinds of projects that were deemed essential throughout the COVID time period, road building, excavation. We actually saw an acceleration in the volume of equipment on that compact dirt um, class of equipment. And then third uh, are really products that proved to be critical as we learned to navigate the pandemic environment. What I mean by that are generators. Generator sales exploded in the April, May, June time horizon as folks needed um, you know, power sources off the grid as we run, as we spun up sort of hospitals and things of that nature. You could add into that lift trucks. Lift trucks really accelerated in the back half of the year as we started ordering everything we do online. There was really a need for a lot more. Uh, There's a lot more demand, let's say, for the lift trucks as warehouses started coming online. So I think the the volume indications that we see really coincide with the trends that we've all been living through in the marketplace. You know, it's fascinating that you mentioned some of those things because you know we we run a we run another business that probably not a lot of folks uh, on here know about called Gov Planet where. You know, we, we see a lot of military surplus and, and you know, we've seen the same sort of thing, the buying of generators and and so forth. And I, you know, I just as as things get stranger and stranger, you know, take Texas a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, a lot of this stuff is in demand. You combine that with, you know, you still got a housing market, right? That is that is still pretty strong. And, and so you're seeing a. Uh, you're seeing great demand for this stuff. Well, looks like we finally got them. Uh, uh, we're we're also joined today uh, by Michael uh, Vasquez of, of Meco Miami uh, to bring us the the dealer perspective uh, on a lot of these trends. And and Michael, why don't you uh, you know why don't you give a quick introduction since we uh, we we missed you a little bit the first time around, and then uh, well, I, talk about I what you're seeing in, in some of these trends. Absolutely. First of all, I'd like to apologize. We had some technical difficulties here on our side. I apologize for that. But what I do want to do is thank you very much for inviting me and also inviting the Associated Equipment Distributors, a 100-year organization based in Chicago that uh, represents over 770 dealers in North America, including Canada and the United States, and does combined revenue of over $60 billion. So for all our dealers out there, this is a huge moment for us because we have an actual voice about what's happening in the industry and also participating, participating today in what we do. My, myself, I'm, I'm based here out of Miami, Florida. I, I run a family-owned business. Uh, we've been in business now 50 years. We sell our all type of heavy construction equipment. We represent major lines like Dynapack, Yanmar, Sani, Alice Copco, Banded Wood Industries. We're a full serv service organization. We do sales, parts, service, rentals, all for South Florida and the Caribbean. So uh, my full-time job is a salesman and, and the vice president of Mico Miami. And my part-time job is working as a executive board member for uh, the Associated Equipment Distributors, which is called AED, and being the vice president of membership. So a lot of people correlate me to like Julie on the love boat. So <laughs> I have a lot of friends and signed up a lot of people and look forward to anybody out there who is a dealer to sign up more so we can make our, our, our voice uh, 
should we say, stronger in the industry and look forward to, to creating a, a, a very good relationship with the Ritchie Brothers and other people in the organization. Now, your question, Doug, again, please, I'm sorry. Yeah, so dude, just talk about what, you, what you've what you seen post, you know, since COVID hit us and, you know, what, what are the dealers experiencing, right? Well, you know, how well, are you the guys dealers, thinking about buying and selling equipment right now? Well, that's a, I think that's a great question. The dealers are, are, are experiencing a boom, especially uh, in Florida. The Florida is open, open for business, as you know. Yep. Our economy is doing very, very well. We have a thousand people moving in to Florida. Uh, I'm going to speak first to Florida, and then we'll talk about other dealers I've spoken with. Florida has no state tax. Uh, we have wonderful weather. Uh, there's a lot of advantages in, in the sense of, uh, of, of growth. There's an enormous amount of, of interesting real estate, attractive for people who want to retire. But the business itself is doing very, very well. Our budget for the state is about $3 billion in the sense of new roads being built in the next five years. That's just on the yearly, on the yearly budget number for next year. So we see things here doing very, very well. And uh, I believe the growth is going to be substantial and tremendous, especially with the circumstances up in New York and other places that a lot of people are leaving. The real you know, estate a lot, market a lot of people out my way are coming your way from from Silicon Valley. Yeah, a lot of people like it. I mean, the real estate. I mean, the the weather's great. Uh, the price of real estate's very attractive, and uh, it's it's a great place to live. Now, speaking for AED and all the other members, we're seeing a, a tremendous growth, especially on the smaller side. A lot of utility equipment. Um, a lot of people working in the homes, a lot of people working in the landscapers, a lot of mini excavators being sold, a lot of directional drills being sold. The larger, larger projects are really dominated by five or six larger players when it comes to the building the roads, the granites, and, and the Archer Westerns and such. But uh, we see our business, for example, we're up uh, 20% from 19 to, to 20. Wow. So it was a very good year for us. And we saw by the auctions in Orlando, the numbers are up and the numbers are strong. So Richie Brothers is doing their job and really doing a great job representing all us dealers when we want to sell or use equipment or trade-ins and in our rental fleet no it's it's been um you know like i said it, it, it's in in many ways it's been god i don't want to say a tale of two worlds or a tale of two cities it's been surprising but, i would say very yeah, surprising you know, but, I, but i think if, if you look at the pandemic if you look at all everything that's going on you know as i was kind of saying before you know, people are still building. People are still moving to homes, right? We still need to put food on the table. We still, you know, need to deliver goods. And and I think we've seen uh, a, a lot of that uh, in in terms of, of of pricing and 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 also in terms of supply and demand. You know, Doug R. You know, I'm showing the 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 Rouse Retail Value Index here. What what? Explain a little bit about that and and what this might mean to folks out there. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so one of the things we do at Rouse is develop data-driven used equipment values across about 70,000 different makes and models, all the different products that you know everybody's buying and selling in the marketplace. And through our value index, we're actually able to measure how those equipment values are trending over a period of time. And that's what this chart illustrates. It's taking out the noise of mix and age and what we're really looking at is the net effect on pricing of the various supply and demand dynamics that we've been talking about here. And what you can see, this is retail values, so private retail transactions from a fleet owner to a buyer. Uh, what you see is that over the course of 2020, uh, retail values were fairly stable. Uh, we, we talk a lot about the COVID trough, if you will, where did where were values you know, right at the onset of COVID? Well, there really wasn't a trough to speak of in the retail marketplace. And some of that's a function of, of really two things. One, well, buyers can certainly, excuse me, sellers can certainly walk away from a retail transaction. So there's no forcing function to have to make that sale, which generally speaking promotes a bit more stability in the retail marketplace relative to an unreserved auction. But I think the more salient point and, and the one that we've all been talking about on this call is that demand has really matched up nicely to supply. Yeah. And when you have that dynamic, you have a lot of stability in retail values. This tells you on this chart that today, retail used equipment values are sitting just 3% lower than they were in January 2020. Really quite a remarkable statement given all the headwinds and all the craziness, Matt, that you talked about leading into this call. It's really quite remarkable that values have maintained such stability 
And in fact, volume, think about the volume chart we just looked at a page or two ago, volumes were up in 2020. We saw 7% more units sold in 2020 than we did in 2019. Remarkable given the conditions we're living in. And and then, you know, if you flip to this one, which is the, you know, the, the auction side, and as Doug spoke, a, the Doug O spoke a little bit about before, you know, there, I think there's that trough you were talking about, but look at that rebound. Yeah, really a remarkable story on the auction. Uh, when COVID gripped us, you know, Ritchie Brothers had to cancel a lot of their live events. Everything had to pivot to an online environment. A lot of uncertainty about whether construction projects would be in a position to continue over the course of 2020. But as things settled in, really in that second quarter of 2020, and we started to get a little bit more confidence and a little bit more visibility into where things were gonna net out here. Uh, rebound is the right word, Matt. It's, this is just an unbelievable chart that reflects, uh, I think, really quite strong demand for equipment. The way to read this data is that today, in um, March of 2021, equipment values sold through the auctions are actually 5% higher than they were last January. And they're in fact 11% uh, higher than that COVID trough that I mentioned, that, that pause, if you will, in April 2020, when we saw some really weak activity when there was so much uncertainty in the marketplace. So the, it, really a good time right now to be selling equipment, whether you're looking at retail or auction, pricing is really, really quite strong in, in spite of the craziness that's all around us. And, and Doug, 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 how, how are how are you seeing this from the, you know, from inside the 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 auction perspective? Um, you know, what 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 do you, I mean? I know we're looking at the trends here, but you know, what are, what are you seeing on the, you know, you know, anything sale by sale, geography by geography, sector by sector, uh, when we hold these auctions? Yeah, Matt, for sure, great question. Uh, what we have seen is just we've seen depth of market as well. So if we if we can the, the supply demand issues if we can find the assets for sure there's depth to, to the asset sectors as well we've seen a lot of that um, leading into Q4 and even into Q1 now too so there's where we didn't see depth a year ago there certainly is now there's so there's so much strong demand in the marketplace and all you have to do is look at our a lot of the a lot of the indicators we have such as watch lists priority bidding, site visits, and whether that be digital or physical, uh, registrations for our sales. When you have a an event like last week in Edmonton and we're up 50% year over year on registrations, just great demand, just great demand in the marketplace. And uh, in turn, obviously we're seeing the pricing, the, the pricing uh, reflects such. And um, yeah, we feel pretty strong right now about the pricing. And obviously there's a lot of things behind the scenes, whether it be the supply chain issues and everything else that uh, everyone's experiencing. So. Thank you, Matt. Michael, what, what do you, you know, speaking of the supply chain, you know, issues, I mean, from a dealer perspective, what, what are you, what are you seeing and hearing from, from the OEMs uh, on that? Well, front? I just want to go back. I just want to go, uh, go back real quick uh, on the, your, on your retail value index. One thing that's very important for all the dealers, especially for everybody involved in AED, is that we need prices to be strong for the residual values of our equipment on the financing side. So if the prices go down tremendously, the banks are going to find out about it. It makes our, our life much more difficult because, unfortunately, about 79% of our deals are still retail deals. The residual value of our products is essential to maintain a strong number at the end. So thus, we're always supporting the fact that we're pushing the prices. We're always very happy when prices are strong. And unfortunately, any, any of us that lived through 08, 09 realize when prices are down and then you need to finance equipment, it's very, very difficult. So thus, the, this index that you have, which is the, uh, the retail value index, is huge for all our dealers because the banks are watching it tremendously and, and we need it. Now, going back to your question on supply side, we're, fi we're finding that there's an enormous problem presently in supplies. Now, we have all our manufacturers uh, forecasting for the year. And right now, if you order a Sani excavator, you order a, a Yamar excavator, you would have to wait probably about three to four months to get it in. And I guess it has to do with, with last year with COVID, with lack of production in the sense of, of shutdowns. But we're seeing uh, an enormous problem when it comes to the new side. And uh, I think it's only going to get worse. And I, I think that will benefit our used equipment departments and, and it will benefit Ritchie Brothers. But everybody's looking for late model equipment, but just very, very difficult to source right now. I mean, in a way, you can almost see it here, right in the age of equipment being sold today, right? I mean, it's 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 
you know, ref reflecting a little bit of that, a little bit of that problem on the supply side. And, and you know, we're hopeful we're going to see that, you know, rebound, uh, you know, at, at the at the end of the year. Uh, you know, as we talked about, I'll, I'll just jump in a little bit here, right? This is how we, you know, one of the ways we track, you know, this this increased demand. You know, Doug Doug O referenced this a little bit earlier, right? We've seen, you know, day in day out, and, and we'll get to Kevin in a little bit, and he can talk, uh, uh, you know, how this is how this is being done, but just tremendous. You know, not only is it not only is it an impact of of you know people coming online. But just an increase in overall demand uh, when it comes to people looking to buy equipment. So this 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 kind of Jekyll and Hyde, uh, you know, approach, you know, from a COVID perspective, where where you know, oh, we we saw all this uncertainty around supply, but the, but the buyers are there because because obviously the, the the projects are are there. And then you know, Doug Doug O, if you could talk a little bit about you know, the, the, the price indexes and, and, you know, how, how, you know, how we're, how we're looking at these and how we're tracking these, you know, these are something uh, we're starting to publish on a, on a monthly basis, you know, but we're, we're just looking at, you know, once again, th these prices are just, they, they continue to, they continue to jump up. Yeah, Matt, for sure. We are seeing that. And uh, I think as, as Doug R alluded to, when you go back to the, the trough or the flattening in back in April of 2020 and, and then the the world changed. Uh, since then, for sure, we've seen a real nice, in, healthy increase in pricing um, all the way through, all the way through Q2, three, four, and now into, into Q1 here. Just strong, solid demand, um, strong pricing across most most asset sectors, uh, most assets, whether it be uh, construction wise. And I know for sure that uh, we've got another chat group going on in the transportation business as well. but. Matt, just to add to your plug about um, deliveries and and transportation and everything else, I mean, there's been a real nice lift in the transportation assets as well. So we've seen it across the board, and it's just been a nice, healthy lift. And uh, we, I think, we'll continue to see the same until some of those supply chain issues have uh, have evened out. So, Michael, talk to us about. Um you know what's going on in Washington. What what are you, what are you seeing that you know is this going to continue? Uh, you know, obviously we've had a change in in the administration. Um, you know, what what's your thoughts? You know, everyone's you know the 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 we just passed an, another COVID stimulus bill. Uh, there's talk more talk of infrastructure. You know, what what are you hearing out of DC? Well, I'll tell you, uh, AED has been working uh, full time uh, on a bipartisan method of going across the aisle and dealing with both parties. And the, the biggest thing for all of us here is that everybody agrees on infrastructure. The only problem that we have is the funding. Uh, the gas tax hasn't been increased since 1993, uh, back when gasoline was a dollar and 11 cents a gallon. So thus, everybody wants to do something. Now, my personal opinion of what's gonna happen and what the association believes is gonna happen, and our dealer members believe it's gonna happen, is that this year they're gonna pass an infrastructure bill. As you know, we've got the, the Democrats have uh, have the House and the Senate. As you said this week, and you referred to the COVID relief plan was passed, $1.9 trillion. I believe in infrastructure, which is a $2 trillion plan, will be passed. The only thing that we have to see is how they're going to get together and work on passing it. And uh, they're going to have to fight it out. Uh, as you know, the environment in, 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 in Washington right now is extremely toxic. Uh, there's a, a huge... Uh, separation between the parties, but yet having the Democrats rule basically the White House, the House, and the Senate, I think they will, this year they will pass the famous infrastructure bill, which is extremely important to all our dealers because we supply the equipment to all the contractors to do the work. So I believe this year will be the year. At the end of the year, I believe it will happen because he got the COVID out of the way. Now infrastructure is going to be the, the primary concern. Yeah, no, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting. I mean, you know, from, from your guys' perspective, is there going to be enough equipment around if uh, uh, if we pass uh, that legislation? I mean, you combine it with the fact that, you know, I think, you know, as we talked about before, you know, housing starts are, are still pretty solid. Uh, looks like oil prices are, are, are starting to rise again. Uh, you know, it's tough to tell from over here in, in Europe because they're, they're, it's, gas is incredibly expensive. 
but uh, you know, uh, interest rates I think are climbing up. So you know, definitely things are you know, and if you've got a uh, if you get involved in you know, maybe you can start a SPAC for uh, uh, for equipment these days. Those are all the rage. I, I it just everything's heating up right now. Uh, you know, we see an infrastructure bill uh, like this come along, and and uh, you know, I, I think things are going to be. Uh, uh, pretty exciting heading into the uh, uh, latter half of the year. Um, you know, one of the things that's that happened, right, is you know, you know, my background. I, I'm not necessarily an equipment guy. Uh, I came primarily from the the online world, um, and and you saw this huge you know, basically acceleration of e-commerce. Uh, you know, people were saying we, we progress like five years in the course of a year. And, you know, a lot of companies out there, right? I'm sure, you know, Michael, we'll get to dealers in a second. Doug, you can talk about the retailers, but a lot of companies out there had to pivot really quickly. And, you know, although, you know, Ritchie Brothers was a live auction, right? And a lot of our operations are built around the live. We had some infrastructure in place that allows us to allowed us to do this. But you know, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin. Kevin, why don't you talk about you know some of the things that you know auctioneers have had to do uh, over the last 12 months and 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 be able to accommodate a lot of this you know online activity, if you will. Yeah. So thank you, Matt. Um, you know, when we pivoted from uh, inviting people on site to bid to having them bid online, and then, of course, with travel restrictions in place for our customers, um, a couple of the things we wanted to do was make sure that, um, A, the, the people selling equipment had confidence that we could transmit the information about it correctly, and that the buying audience would have enough information to make their decisions wisely. And so, you know, in Orlando, we tested a few things, um, being one of our bigger events and, and certainly high profile in a lot of people's mind. The first thing we rolled out the door with was, um, you know, videos for uh, equipment that people could come in and look at a video online uh, to their satisfaction. So we went out to Chilliwack, we are one of our sites in Canada, and we asked customers what they want to see in a video. And then we translated that to uh, what we did in Orlando. Another thing we did was uh, we opened up the use of priority bid, which allows customers to come in. Um, in. In the case of Orlando, it was just about two weeks ahead of time and place bids on equipment that they were comfortable. Um, they could leave their max bid and just be bid up at increments that the auctioneer was on. And so they didn't have to worry about overpaying for equipment, but they didn't have to worry about losing if they weren't able to be in front of their computer at the time that it was sold. Um, we still allow people to come on site and view equipment um, and inspect it to their their satisfaction before buying it if they were able to get there. Um, virtual sales option is something that we've tried for about a year, a year and a half now, um, and we're expanding to other sites. So customers can actually leave equipment uh, on their own site. We'll come out and inspect it, and then we'll offer ironclad assurance on that item through a Ritchie Brothers auction. And that is something that we're looking to expand here in the next couple of years. Um, of course, you know, enhancements to our mobile application. Um, and then another thing we tested as well was doing concierge inspections for customers so that um, with a certain group, we, we tested to see um, if having them call into an inspector and having an inspector stand at a piece of equipment with an iPhone or an iPad and allow the customer to ask questions would, would be something that uh, would enhance the buying experience. So we're testing that as well. As far as how we pivoted, uh, as Matt said, the technology for Ritchie Brothers to pivot to an online has been there for years in our uh, online Ringman application. And so it was just a question of making sure that everybody knew how to use it um, and were comfortable getting online in order to place our bids. Uh, for COVID, um, our auctioneers are able to sell from re remote locations. So most of our selling is done from um, our Kansas City site, our Fort Worth site, and our Nashville site. And then we have two auctioneers that have what we call home kits. Um, they sell from their homes outside of Philadelphia and North Carolina. So, you know, Iron Planet, Ritchie Brothers, Rouse, they've always been companies of innovation. Uh, we're going to continue to innovate. Um, I know a question came in from from the panel that 
you know, will we have live auctions uh, once the pandemic passes? You know, that's under evaluation and, and certainly there's an aspect the Ritchie Brothers which will always be social, but it's all about choice. And what we're finding out is that some people are intimidated by live auction. Some people prefer uh, buying online only. Um, so, you know, as we collect this data, we're going to evaluate how we use it and what the auctions of the future are going to look like. Cool. Yeah. And it's been, you know, it certainly has been, um, you know, an interesting transition, I think, for, you know, for everybody in the space. Michael, on, on the dealer side, are you, do you guys see much impact here? Are you, are you seeing much? Are you seeing an increase in, in kind of online traffic, uh, you know, uh, things coming in, you know, buyers coming to you online? Uh, through some of these new channels? Absolutely. Uh, every day we see it more and more because unfortunately, I mean, here in our office in Miami, Miami, for example, Day County, we were extremely affected last uh, uh, last year with, with this whole coronavirus and the, and the COVID was terrible. Uh, it's very hard to believe that here in the state of Florida, we've had over 30,000 deaths uh, just alone with people dying. So unfortunately, our office was literally locked for four months. And, you know, we go out in the back and meet people. So people got used to the fact that, you know, if either you talk to us on the phone or you deal through, through, on, through, through any method online, communication or some of the sites, it's every day more and more. It's something that's very difficult for me that I started, I'm 53 years old. I started going to auctions when I was 15 years old in uh, in Lexington, Kentucky and in coal mines up in West Virginia when it was basically, if you were there, you would buy it. And <laughs> sometimes there were not many people there and you get some great deals. The world's changed and everybody now has a phone. The internet's absolutely everywhere in the world. So the, the process of buying online has made it a lot easier for everyone, not just for the people at Ritchie Brothers, but people like my wife at Amazon and other people who, who just spend all day on their phones pushing yep. buttons to get things. And, and the format you have now is extremely, very, very convenient for anyone who wants to buy equipment because you've got all the information on your fingertips. It's an excellent system. No, cool. Uh, you know, so, hey, hey, we just got a question here I, I thought it'd be interesting to address. Um, you know, with all this pricing information, do you guys do appraisals? Uh, so, Doug R., I, I think, why don't you, because uh, I know Rouse does appraisals and, you know, kind of the pricing information is, is basically embedded in the history of Rouse. Why don't you talk about that a little bit in the context of kind of everything that that Rouse does? Because I think it's a you know quite a wide array of solutions. Yeah, th thanks, Matt. Uh, and, and certainly, our appraisals are part of the product portfolio at Rouse. I mentioned earlier that we're an information services business. So, what the heck does that really mean? Well, we really have three, we run three different businesses at Rouse, all built around uh, proprietary transactional data that we collect from the marketplace. So our appraisals group uh, executes hundreds of appraisals each year. Those are primarily geared towards transaction services. So buy side, sell side, asset based loans, uh, if you're trying to grow fleet. But our appraisals group has really been the gold standard for quite some time that the rental industry has grown up on. On top of the appraisals group, we also run a used equipment sales division, which is really geared towards delivering marked to market equipment values back to sellers of equipment so they can make the right channel decisions, pricing decisions as they think about what equipment they might wanna roll out of their fleets. And then to round out our offering, we also offer a rental analytics division, which provides very granular rental metrics, think rate, utilization, market share, things of that nature to rental companies so that they can make better decisions about their own rental performance and maybe what part of their fleet they wanna be investing in versus not. So across the spectrum, we try to offer products to fleet owners that really run the full gamut, whether you're buying equipment on the appraisal side, renting equipment throughout the life cycle of using it or selling equipment at the point of disposals. Really, there's a, there's a data product within the Rouse family to, to help you try to drive better decisions on, on your business. No, and I, and I think that's, that's one of the more interesting things since, since I've been in this space you know, as I mentioned before, I came came from other sectors, primarily online, just the the amount of data out there and, you know, and how can we make it available to folks to make proper decisions? So speaking of data, a question here, uh, Doug, o, let's come back to you. Wheel loaders, uh, notice they were down. What's what's you know, what 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 is impacting 
uh, wheel loader volumes uh, from 2019 to 2020. What do we think there? Yeah, Matt, so, so I guess when you look at it, you think how many units we came, that came through the auction business last year, and you think again, back to uh, dealers uh, having, in, having issues to supply new units. I think obviously we only sell the assets that we get our hands on. And last year, it just seemed like the, the amount of, of light construction, whether it be light construction, general construction, or even uh, quarry, uh, quarry and mining, um, wheel loaders right across all those sectors. Um, obviously, um, people are hanging on to them and uh, we just didn't see a, a, as many as we saw the previous year. So just a couple things there, obviously, with uh, so dealer supply issues, OEM supply issues, and then obviously just the amount of work out there that's uh, being undertaken in the marketplace. We're just not seeing as many come through the channel, and we will see it. It'll come. We uh, we think it'll come whether it's late this late this year or the latter part of, part of the year when again with OEMs catch up to production and we see some of those um, come through the the channel. We uh, we expect to see again. So. Any uh, uh, question for you guys, just, you know, kind of off the, the top of my head and, and, and Michael, maybe this one's for you. Um, uh, you know, what are, are there any, are there, what should we be looking at in terms of, uh, you know, features or, or, you know, certain types of assets, you know, what, any, any changes in the technology, you know, of the equipment itself? that that you think is, is that you see you know whether it's i don't know electric uh powered equipment whether it's um you know uh, autonomous operation uh you know what what are you seeing out there in terms of that i know the oems are struggling with supply in general but are we going to see any impact from that in the in the near future or is it pretty much going to be steady as she goes i think that's a great question and i've participated uh in a, a webinar with the president of Komatsu, president of Dynapack, president of, of uh, Doosan about this same problem. The problem we have is this, it's, it's real simple. First of all, it's very difficult to find mechanics slash technicians now. So someone that you have to hire has to be under 40 and has to know how to use a computer. So it's very difficult for our business to really grow without having the proper people to take care of it. Anonymous, uh, autonomous is something completely different. That is, will be the future, I think, in, in transportation, but also equipment. But I don't think we're there yet. Our biggest problem uh, when it comes to technology and, and our, our biggest hurdle, especially a company like ourselves based in South Florida that sells into South Central America, Africa, the Middle East, is when the tier three, tier four conversion took place. You know, as you know, yeah. 2012, U.S. government changed emission standards. What's going to happen to the export business? Well, as you know, the export business has gone down. So thus, people are still trying to buy the, the machines pre-tier uh, tier four. So that's been a huge problem for us. But the biggest problem is finding the correct people to work on this equipment because it's basically becoming a plug-in. Everything, that, that, and you know, we're in 20, 2021, technology is everything. I mean, there's no more cranking up, let me see how it sounds. It's all about what the computer says. And I think at the long term, uh, we're going to be like cash registers at a McDonald's. I mean, you give the guy $20 and the, and, and the computer will tell you what's wrong, how much does it change, and give it back. So I believe technology is going to kick in, and in the future, it's going to be more complicated for people. But we'll simulate to it, just like the auctions did and just like all dealers did when Tier 4 came around. You know, it's not even an issue anymore. It is what it is. Cool. No, I, th I think that's a, a – you know, the, the, the technology trend – Right is you know whether you're whether you're in auctions, whether you're in equipment and manufacturing, whether you're in you know retail nowadays, whether you're in medicine, right? You know the 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 pace of change is just uh, continuing to 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 drive us forward. And you got to keep up with it. You got to keep up with it. Uh, and that's you know, excellent. I, by the way, that's three. That's like excellent for the dealers. Excellent. By the way, we have our, we have a very lucrative service department that likes to service equipment that nobody else can fix. So it plays very well for us at, at $150 an hour uh, working on people's equipment because the gentleman doesn't know how to regen a machine or he, he turned the key switch five times instead of once. So th this is something that will benefit our dealers and something that we're, that we're very, very uh, ca cautious of, of what's going to happen in the future. But equipment is becoming extremely difficult to fix, same as an automobile, and every day it's going to be, it's going to be more complicated. So we're, we're really looking forward to it. And I think some of the manufacturers have done a tremendous job job training the dealers how to fix it and 
and it's going to be a while before anybody can. I don't think there's any aftermarket system to fix an equipment if it's not through a dealer. I have a I have an interesting question that's come in, um, you know, online. That's a that's a little bit uh, orthogonal to the to the 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 discussion, but I think interesting nonetheless. So if I'm a young entrepreneur and I'm looking to enter the equipment rental space, what's some advice uh, that you guys would have uh, for for someone trying to do that? Michael, maybe you, I know I know you guys do some rental. What, what, what might be some advice for, for a young entrepreneur there? Well, I think the first advice is not to talk about politics. <laughs> Number one, <laughs> there's a, here in Florida, there's, it's, 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 this is Trump country. And I had the, one of our sons, uh, one of my friend's sons came in here and, and his dad asked him to come in and uh, he wasn't doing anything. He was working in one of the rental companies and, and uh, he says, you know, I'm just not getting any business. I said, you know, I don't understand why. I said, well, what do you talk about? Well, I always talk about, you know, what kind of idiot Donald Trump is. And I said, well, th there you go. <laughs> There's just a reason why you don't That's... have to have opinions. <laughs> no, the, I think the best thing you can do if you want to get into the equipment rental business is is start off at, uh, at a dealership that trains you. You got to have a mentor. You have to have training. And you have to know what you're doing. And you have to know about the product before you sell it, even on the rental side. If somebody wants to buy a JLG 2630, you have to know what 2630 means. So uh, I think... The best thing to do is get a job in a rental house and have sus sus an enormous amount of training uh, so you can sustain your career and know more. So when a customer comes to you saying, I need to go down 18 feet and I'm digging in coral rock or I need to lift a structure that's 18,000 pounds and lift it out 12 feet, you have to know what you're selling. So I think uh, getting the experience and have someone mentoring you would be huge. Got it. Got it. Well, let, let's um, let's let's shift to a, a slightly different topic. I'll, I'll be at the, I'll be at, you know, on, on par with what we're talking about. We've been talking about technology, right? And um, just how it's reshaping, you know, everything we're doing and, and talking about data, right? I mean, data, you know, you know, at the underpinnings of, of a lot of the technology solutions out there is data. And there's just there's just more data sloshing around uh, probably than ever before. And, and and I think one of the 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 interesting things that that you know we're starting you know as, as I come into the, the the equipment market is just trying to bring this data together and offer it in a way that you know Michael folks like you folks like the dealers can 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 use it to to help make decisions. You know, talk to us. You know, talk to us about some of the data tools you use in, in, in your day-to-day -day business. Well, the, the most important thing for us is always the value. Uh, how much is a machine worth uh, in the sense of uh, when we take a trade in? And uh, what is it worth if we're going to put it in an auction? That's enormous for us because it will, I mean, as you very well know, our prices are predicated on what it's worth. And uh, as I told you before on the data side, uh, that we have to be uh, with the banks that we work with, that's all they're looking at is the residual values of, of the product that we have. So the data for us is essential when it comes to selling uh, our products and also and receiving products. But uh, the most important thing that we all have to understand is that when, the, when business is good, then everybody's extremely happy. And the numbers have to be strong. And I believe Ritchie Brothers is the, is the world premier auction that gets more value for your money and equipment than anybody else. And that's why we solely only work with Ritchie Brothers and have for many years, because it's all about the price. And the data is important because we need it. But the price that's reflected in the data is really uh, the indicator for all of us. And, and maybe, Doug R., maybe you can, you know, how does, you know, what is, you know, I know Rouse has been a data provider over the years. Talk about some of the, if you can, just maybe some of the methodologies uh, to some extent that you guys use to put out uh, your, how are you bringing it all together, right? I mean, how, how do you, I mean, with all that equipment coming in, uh, you know, all that data coming in, Jesus, how, how, do, how do you just pull those reports together? How do you pull those benchmarks together and get that out in a, in a, in a timely manner? Yeah, it's a great question, Matt. And I think, you know, look, you said it at the outset, there's a lot of data sets out there. There's, we're awash in data. And if you if you end up operating in the construction equipment space, there's also a lot of models and a lot of manufacturers. And the, the con, sort of the way these two things play with each other 
is very challenging, right? Because the, the, the concept of valuation is inevitably, how do you make smart decisions from what end up as sort of small sample sizes of information when you're trying to value a very specific machine that sits out in your yard that has a given configuration and a given meter reading. It can be very challenging to find a good analog, a very specific transaction that reflects all the characteristics and all the inputs of the machine that you're thinking about. So what Rouse has done, and we've um, re perfected this, refined this over the course of the last 20 or so years, is we start by making sure we've got a really rich set of transactions. And that's where our customers um, really uh, are critical to us. We collect the transactions that our customers are executing. And we spend an awful lot of time making sure we code all the given inputs and characteristics of that, those machines correctly. Because if we get the syntax, the terminology dialed into a model level, if we really understand, does that machine have outriggers or does it have you know, 3D enabled technology, picking up on the conversation we were just having, we're then in a position to blend the data set together in really smart ways and be able to deliver back to the marketplace, to our customers, data-driven um, estimates of where the market truly is on a given machine without needing six or seven or 10 exact comparable sales of that specific setup. So we've spent an awful lot of time building these data connections, building the tools that are necessary to properly take care of this uh, fairly messy and constantly moving data set. And, and, and by doing that, we're able to deliver really what we think are very effective tailored numbers back to our customers so that they can make the right decision on a given machine. Michael's point is right. If you're dealing yeah. with a trade-in, the, the worst thing you can do is make a bad financial decision on the front side because you'll never get yourself out of it. So we've, we've worked really hard to make sure we're able to deliver accurate reflections of the channels of sales so that our customers can make good decisions. Excellent. No, and, and I think, um, you know, once again, right, with, with all of the sources of data out there, right, delivering that in a timely manner, right, I, I, it just, it, it's critical to, you know, because these, these machines are, are, are worth so much, right? And this is, you know, once again, something a little new to me. Hey, one last question here, and it's kind of an interesting one, and I think, Doug R., this one, this one is probably for you. Um, but, you know, one of the things that, you know, once again, looking at the data, Right, the average age of the aerial fleet that the rental companies are moving is 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 growing, you know, growing and growing and growing. But they're moving a lot at retail versus auction. Um, you know, any 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 thoughts on uh, on that? And and you know, even though the age is going up, they're still they're still able to move at retail uh, versus sending it to auction. What 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 do you you, know, what, you seen anything there? Yeah, so I think that that's a keen observation. Um, aerial equipment coming out of the rental houses generally is selling at, you know, call it about 90 months of age. So it is a fairly aged asset. And as I mentioned earlier, it's really a rental first asset. So that is, those rental houses really are the supply of a lot of the used equipment, um, you know, on those types of products. W what happens to be true is that a lot of rental companies have built uh, let's call it retail selling capability that they use in very targeted places. And Ariel is one of those places that they tend to focus a lot of time. And there's a very good reason for that. There's a, there's an, an, uh, there's a gap, let's say, a difference between a retail equipment value and an auction equipment value. And that gap, that distinction varies based on the type of equipment you're looking at and the age profile of the equipment you're looking at. And in aerial equipment, the retail market has historically commanded a fairly significant price advantage relative to an auction value. And so rental companies that know that are targeting their resources against selling those through the retail channel. Um, contrast that with compact dirt equipment, even some of the heavier dirt equipment where the gap between a retail value point and an auction value point, much narrower, much closer to one another. You'll see a lot more of that equipment coming out of rental houses, perhaps moving through auctions because the opportunity cost, let's say, in terms of value capture is much narrower. And so I think what, you, what, you're, what the observation is right, that rental companies are steering the resources they have to selling the higher uh, value products into the retail marketplace, and they seem to have developed quite a skill set to do so. Yeah, and, and I think, and you know, I, I think with with us approaching the hour, let me let me end it there uh, with the questions. But I think you know one of the interesting things 
you know, just just a, fi a final comment here. You're looking at all these uh, tools in, in front of us. And, and, you know, when I think about, you know, Ritchie Brothers and, you know, it's not just an auction company anymore. And, and you know, we, you know, as a company are out there offering tools to, you know, all our customers, uh, you know, and we're going to help you sell. We're going to help you buy in any channel out there, right? You know, if you want to, if you're selling it yourself, we've got tools to help you. If you need to send it to auction, we've got multiple solutions. If you need to store it on our yards, right? If you need video inspections, you, this is that this is kind of where we're going. This is this is where the the you know with all this change you know happening in the space, you know the ability to give you know folks like Michael out there lots of different solutions to meet the needs of their business, not just when they're selling, but when they're operating their machinery or when they're when they're when they're building their websites and, and so forth. We are here to drive that. So with that, uh, I want to thank everybody. Uh, for their time today and we hope this has been a beneficial and and look forward to us doing more of these in the future and hopefully you know uh, you know if we can all get our vaccine soon we can uh, you know be doing this in person in the in the next couple of months so appreciate everybody's time today and and stay safe out there thank you very much Aww.